The current generation of Pali fans is lucky. They have the internet and get the latest discoveries in the blink of an eye. But back then, it was not that simple to learn about dinosaurs. In the old ages before the internet, us fans had to rely on four ways to learn about the prehistoric, not counting films, museums, books, educational games, and documentaries. And that last part is our topic today. Let's take a trip down the memory line and take a look back at some of these dinosaur documentaries and see how it went like, how it evolved, and what set them apart from each other. Vintage dinosaur documentaries are fascinating. They were real pieces of art and it is one of the reasons why they stood out. Unlike real life nature documentaries, there was no easy way to make them. You can't just book a ticket to a secluded jungle and film dinosaurs in their natural habitat. You had to make your own footage. Unless you were the cheap kind and just use whatever was made already, but besides the point. Now I talked briefly about them in my walking with dinosaurs video, but most of dinosaur documentaries follow some specific formulas. Either they were entirely dependent on animation followed by a narrator, or they are figures talking about dinosaurs in a museum or digging site, sometimes combining the two together, as we will see later. Now it takes no brainer to say these vintage documentaries are dated as hell. Most of what they said is pretty much outdated information or flat out wrong. But that's another fascinating part about them. They are their own time capsules of paleontology. A reminder of how we used to see dinosaurs and how far our knowledge has reached from that point in an ever evolving field. Or we find out they were right all along on some aspects or predicted something that will be discovered later. Others would simply go back to these documentaries just for the dinosaur effects they used and we will see the different approaches used in each of them. So here's how things gonna work. There were many documentaries made, some are still available to watch online, others can't be found anymore, so we are going to skip these. Also I'm going to stick to the ones I had personal experience with to keep it as short as possible. So there's a chance I'm going to skip that one documentary you saw but I didn't. With that said, I'm going to start with the first documentary that caught my eyes, 1991's Dinosaur. This was a four-part documentary hosted by the late CBS anchorman Walter Cronkite. Each part covered a certain theme and Walter Cronkite narrates for us or conducts interviews with several personalities related to dinosaurs all the way to some entertainment personalities. We all know that dinosaurs are not around today. They died out 65 million years ago. In this program we ask why. After a reign of 150 million years, what happened? Did they fail to adapt, or were they just unlucky, or have we been wrong all along? The effects here were done according to credits by Peter Minister Model Effects, Rachel Nettles, and Lyons Model Effects. At first I wasn't sure what they were, I couldn't tell if these were suits or puppets, but concluded they were puppets with gloves used for some close-up shots. There were also some CGI dinosaurs, but only used for distant shots, and the way they moved it always felt unnatural to me. It's getting deep in the uncanny valley and that's why I was creeped at them the first time I saw it. I mean look at this allosaurus and tell me it's not nightmare fuel. I'm also loving the musical score here. It's one of those scores you wish they released an official soundtrack to accompany the series. Brachiosaurus means arm lizard. It got its name because of the extraordinary length of its arms, up to 15 feet. At 33 feet long and 2 tons in weight, it brought... Now for the next one, we go back in time to 1970 and with some classic stop motion claymation with Dinosaurs the Terrible Lizards, a 10 minute dinosaur documentary with very basic information. Nothing too deep about it but it's always fun to go back to these vintage dinosaur designs animated. The animation is credited to Douglas Biswick, but this version is commonly referred to as the Wachang's Dinosaurs. 
Hua Chang was a Chinese American artist, designer, and sculptor who owned his own studio for filmmaking and would later be best known for creating some of Star Trek the original series' most iconic props, including the tribbles, tricorders, and the communicators. In 1986, a revised version of the documentary was made with a different script written by Ruth Izzik, replacing the original written by Ellsworth Klehar. A great brontosaurus was slow, spending much of the time in the water of warm tropic swamps probably going on land only to lay its eggs in the dry, sun-drenched sand of the beaches. Brontosaurus was one of the largest dinosaurs. When he walked, his footsteps must have sounded like thunder. In fact, his name means thunder lizard. And this revised version was released on VHS and 16mm film for libraries. The footage, along with another short film titled Age of Mammals, were later combined to one single episode in an edition titled Dinosaurs and Other Strange Creatures, released under the Mr. Know It Owls video encyclopedia from 1988, which is the version I first saw. But since the Mr. Know It Owl is the more known version, I thought it'd be appropriate to highlight the original release first. Well, hello there. Living here in the forest, I meet many other animals like the fox and the bear and the squirrel. Next up we have Dinosaur from 1985, not to be confused with the other Dinosaur from 1991. Ok, here's how they usually separate the two apart. The one from 1991 is referred to as the Water Cronkite Dinosaur, while the one from 1985 is referred to as the Christopher Reeve Dinosaur. Yes, the classic Superman, that Christopher Reeve, is the host of this documentary. Running at nearly 50 minutes, the documentary goes the museum tour and Pelly figures interviews route. And while it uses many stock footage from films and cartoons, the biggest standout about it other than Christopher Reeve himself is the inclusion of go-motion sequences done by the legendary effect artist Phil Tibbet. Prior to the documentary, Tibbet made his short film Prehistoric Beast and we get the same quality with all footage he made here with other dinosaurs and set pieces. The baby duck dough would reach the size of the platyosaur or a German shepherd very quickly. He would still be too short to reach the best foliage. Duckbills, it's estimated, ate about 200 pounds of foliage a day, and like a cow or elephant today, spent most of his waking hours eating. Some of you may recognize this footage from other documentaries made later, but most probably from the 1993 educational game 3D Dinosaur Adventure by Knowledge Adventure, which was also where I first saw them. This is their legacy. This and the fantasy of the movies and television, toys, t-shirts. But really the legacy goes beyond these things. Because dinosaurs teach us about evolution and about survival. And they challenge us to learn about their mysteries. We are, in fact, only on the threshold of knowing about these beasts. They're still locked in our imagination. We move then to 1992's The Dinosaurs. Or to make it more specific, PBS The Dinosaurs, after the network it was produced for. This was a four-episode miniseries narrated by American actress Barbara Filden, most famous for playing Agent 99 in the 1960s series Get Smart. The story of dinosaurs in modern times begins in the 18th century in Holland, the city of Maastricht. Once 70 million years ago, this was the bottom of a sea, a warm sea. And here limestone was formed. The presentation was not too dissimilar to the Cronkite version. However, unlike that version, Felden only provides the narration instead of making full-on appearances, so you won't see her interviewing the figures shown. Instead of poetry or claymation, the series features hand-drawn animation sequences provided by Encyclopedia Britannica Educational Corporation, and it is one of the best animated dinosaurs I have seen. The animation was played straight, they didn't make it cartoony to appeal to children, and the designs were extremely accurate for its time, and may have even been ahead of time, and this was one year before Jurassic Park. And speaking of being ahead of its time, one detail I used to make fun of was the studio giving stock alligator sounds to the Predators, which at the time I thought it was lazy for them to do instead of making their own original sounds. <laughs> Only till more recent studies are starting to lean more to dinosaurs making vocals not different from birds or crocodiles instead of the thunderous sounds you usually hear in films. Like Christopher Reeve's dinosaur documentary, some of the footage was later used in another educational game, 
This time is Microsoft Dinosaurs from 1993. Next is a different beast. Instead of a single documentary or a miniseries, how about an entire series dedicated to paleontology? That's where we get 1994's Paleo World, also known as Jurassica in European regions. It's a series that first aired on the Learning Channel, then on Discovery Channel, from 1994 to 1997 and ran for 4 seasons with a total of 50 episodes. The series covered a lot of subjects including how the pterosaurs could fly, mistaken dinosaurs for mythological creatures, dinosaur graveyards, and yes, even dinosaur sex. Oh my. Probably the least researched and most misunderstood part of dinosaur behavior is sex. Oh my. After all the singing, stomping, and headbutting was over, the dinosaurs finally got down to some real romance. Oh my. By all accounts, the impressive size of the dinosaurs was not matched by the size of their sex organs. Oh my. Halstead not only published his theories, he famously demonstrated them in his lectures. Oh my. I look like this. Imagine now that I have a tail coming here, and my hand is doing, I can actually get under, twist my tail, she can twist her tail, and we can get two cloaca into direct, correct position. Oh my, my, my. Now sadly, the weakest aspect of the series was the huge lack of original dinosaur footage. Whenever they showcase the dinosaurs, they're mostly still footage from art pieces, museum fossils, or dynamation animatronics. You would think for a relatively long-running series like this, they'd spare some budget for their own original effects, but unfortunately we didn't get any of them, and so, this series could be boring to you unless you're really into the science talk. But we could all agree, the theme music kicks ass. For the next part, I'm going to talk dinosaur episodes that were part of a bigger series. While they were not their own documentaries, I think they deserve to be grouped together with the regular ones since they pretty much serve the same purpose of educating the viewer. Starting with Mimo Ero Ero Yomi no Tabi, or Mimo the Traveler of Many Dreams, an educational anime from 1983 that ran until 1985 with 127 episodes. The anime is about Mimu, this hairy looking creature who pops out of a computer and teach children about many subjects ranging from science to history. While the episode in question started as a dinosaur episode, it quickly switches to be about Charles Darwin to understand how dinosaurs disappeared with the fuels of survival of the fittest and natural evolution. In fact, it was this episode where I learned who Darwin is and what evolution means. Eventually, there was a dinosaur specific episode. However, it came from one of the later seasons which was not broadcasted here and therefore I have no nostalgic attachment to it. From one educational anime to another, we have Manga Doshite Monogatari, roughly translates to Animated Stories to Understand Things. It is the second part of a four part educational series starring a big sister character and a mascot character, combining both live action and animated sections, with the first series first premiering in 1978 and the second premiering in 1984 until the series ended in 1991. The dinosaur episode was 10 minutes long as the format of each episode was two 10 minute segments in an episode. With this short amount of time, they could only talk about the bare basics like what dinosaurs are and so on. And speaking of animation, I'm pretty sure you all will get disappointed if I didn't mention the Magic School Bus. Now in case you're not familiar with it, the Magic School Bus is an educational franchise that started as a series of books in 1985. It was created by Joanna Cole and Bruce Diggin and currently owned by Scholastic Corporation. But it is more popular as a 1994 animated series by Nelvana. The premise of the series is basically the teacher, Miss Frizzle, taking her class in many educational adventures by using the titular Magic School Bus. Which is kind of odd to say they're using magic for science when you think about it. The episode The Bossosaurs from the second season is the dinosaur focused episode. The class goes to a dig site and the ever annoying Carlos goes in how old dinosaurs were bloodthirsty monsters and Miss Frizzle proves him wrong by going back to the past because magic or science 
and the class gets an adventure 65 million years in the past, and Arnold fought a Tyrannosaur. The episode was based on one of the books, and it was even adapted to one of the video games of the series. Guess that shows how popular dinosaurs with kids in those days. Moving back to live action series stuff, we got Nova, a science program that ran on PBS channels since 1974 and still running to this day with a total of 47 seasons and 884 episodes by the time of writing the script. The episode chosen here comes from season 18, T-Rex Exposed, first premiered in 1991. As the title shows, this episode focuses on the Tyrannosaur. It details the uncovering of a preserved, nearly completed skeleton in Montana, as well as going to what made the Tyrannosaur such a dinosaur icon. The original effects you'll find here are the ones in relation to the specimen found. The rest are film and cartoon stock footage coupled with Phil Tippett's animation pieces. Moving from one Tyrannosaurus episode to another Tyrannosaurus episode. This time from the Ultimate Guy series, a series of documentaries by Discovery Channel that started in 1996 all the way to 2002 with a total of 25 episodes. The Tyrannosaurus episode was its very first episode. The documentary is of course about the titular dinosaur and it goes far deep into how it lived, how its anatomy worked, and there's even the debate if it was a hunter or a scavenger years before the argument was sparked by Jurassic Park 3. There's a controversy right now, um, of which I seem to be the <clears throat> to be one side of, and almost everyone else in paleontology seems to be at the other side of. And this has to do with Tyrannosaurus rex being a predator or a scavenger. And I think it shows conclusively that Tyrannosaurus rex was a predator and not a scavenger as some have thought. The Tyrannosaurus effects were a mix of puppets and stop motion. The only puppet parts made were for the head and feet while everything else wasn't made in stop motion. The cinematography of the head puppet for the most part was unfortunately terrible due to the constant extreme close-ups and shaky cams. But for the design itself, it is surprisingly closer to the model design minus the exposed teeth and credit is due to not going for the Jurassic Park Stan Winston design like what many had done in the post-film period. And to another science show, a fan favorite that is, Eyewitness, a series from 1994 produced by BBC based on the Darling Kindersley Eyewitness books, famous for its visuals and the ever-memorable 3D museum that I'm pretty sure everyone has dreamt of going into. The Dinosaur episode was the fourth episode of the first season. In the British version, it was narrated by the late Andrew Sachs, and in the American version, it was narrated by Martin Sheen. Tyrannosaurus rex, the largest meat-eater ever to walk the earth. One of the hundreds of dinosaurs that have been reconstructed and, well, not exactly brought back to life. Tyrannosaurus rex, the largest meat-eater ever to walk the earth. One of the hundreds of dinosaurs that have been reconstructed and, well, not exactly brought back to life. The documentary was also on the basic side, exploring the history of dinosaur discovery and the special attributes of dinosaurs and where their place in pop culture. However, the abstract presentation of Eyewitness is where this franchise stood out. So even if the info was not considered new to you, you can still enjoy the presentation. And to end this one, we have BBC's Walking with Dinosaurs from 1999, a series that revolutionized dinosaur documentaries or just documentaries in general where instead of taking the speculation or investigation route with the usual figures, this is played straight as a nature documentary blending real-life locations with CGI and puppetry following the example of Jurassic Park. This series is also where I think is the line to draw between the vintage traditional documentaries and modern documentaries, truly the splitting point between two eras. And following this series, we had some copycats or taken inspirations from it, like When Dinosaurs Roamed America, the Truth About Killer Dinosaurs, Dinosaur Revolution, and March of the Dinosaurs to name a few. Even Walking with Dinosaurs made its own copycats by sequels and spin-offs in the Walking with brand. But personally, none of them reach the same ingenuity. The CGI used in many of the newer documentaries looks very cheap in comparison, sometimes going full CGI, dropping the filming on location part, and some of the ones I caught on TV felt like they were trying too hard to make their presentation cool for the kiddies by having overly excited hosts. Which is pointless if you ask me since dinosaurs are already cool. You don't need to remind us of that and when you do, you only embarrass yourself. And that's where I have to end it. There are still many documentaries made that I didn't talk about simply because I'm not familiar with them. Every day I uncover something new I didn't know it existed. Some of it I wish I did, 
others I wish I didn't. But that mirrors paleontology in real life. Whenever we think we knew everything about dinosaurs, we uncover something new that changes our view on them. But we don't forget or ignore the path we took to reach this point. That's life for you. So what about you all? What were the paleo documentaries you grew up with? What was your first one to get you into this world of science and mystery? Do you have a favorite in specific? As always, comment down below and tell us your thoughts and share your memories. And I'll see you next time.